as we continue our study of the Trinity. Last week, Pastor Peter started us out and he gave us a nice broad overview of the doctrine of the Trinity. And if you're anything like me, you may have had to listen to it a couple times this week to try to kind of grasp um, the complexity of this doctrine. But it's such a mystery to us, but it's such a beautiful thing to discuss who God is. And so last week was an overview. And so today and the two following weeks, we're going to take time to look at each distinct person of the Trinity. So today we're talking about the Father, then we will do the Son, and then we'll talk about the Holy Spirit. And so just as a quick review, if you were not here, I do encourage you to listen to it, but just quickly so that we can have a jumping off point. The Trinity, we, we know the Trinity consists of the Father, Father God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Peter reviewed the foundations of the Trinity, which is there is one God, so we don't believe that it's many gods, it is one God who coexists eternally in three distinct persons who are co-equal. And so today we are talking about one of those distinct persons of God, and that is God the Father. And I'm going to take a little bit longer of a runway today to actually get to the scripture portion. But don't worry, we will be studying scripture today. We're going to look at a couple of verses in 1 John. But I need to lay, I want to take a little bit more time to lay a foundation to get us to why uh, God being our Father is so absolutely amazing. Why it is such good news for us. So I'm going to lay a little bit, I'm going to take a little bit longer uh, at the intro here so that we can really uh, have scripture come alive to us. So I'm going to start with a question. If I asked each one of you today, as you were leaving the building, if I did a survey, stopped each one of you, and asked you the question, why did Jesus come? Why did he come to earth? I think most of us would give a variation of the answer that he came to die for our sins that he, to, to, to reconcile us, to, to forgive our sins, to be the atonement for our sins, some version of that answer. And that's true, and that's a right answer. But perhaps a more accurate answer of why Jesus came would be to say so that we could be in relationship with God. So we could be restored back to the Father. So Jesus did come, and we're going to talk about Jesus next week, but he did come and die to uh, atone for our sins so that we could be justified so that we could be back in relationship with the Father. Before the fall, Scripture says, if you read the account of Genesis, it says that God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. They were in relationship, walking together, close relationship, and sin came and brought a divide in that relationship, separated us from God, And so Jesus came so that we could be restored back to that relationship. And so Christianity is about knowing God. If you had to summarize Christianity in maybe the shortest possible way you could say it, I would describe it as that. Christianity is knowing God. And we know that there's different types of knowing. You can know information about something. I might know about uh, you know, a certain mountain range, but doesn't know, mean I'm personal with it, doesn't mean I live there, doesn't mean I understand it, I can know information about something, but when we talk about knowing God, we're talking about a knowing that's a deep relationship, like I know my spouse, I know his, his passions, his hurts, how he's going to react, his dreams, his history, I know him personally, and that's the type of knowing we're talking about when, when Jesus came so that we could know God. And so when we are just taking time this month to learn about God, who God is, um, we must start with this reality, that he is personal, that he is relational. So this is the first jumping off point I want to make clear. It is a relationship. And the Trinity, like Pastor Peter talked about last week, the Trinity is a relationship. And C.S. Lewis describes the Trinity as like a dance where each person is preferring and deferring to the other one and working in perfect uh, unity. And so the Trinity 
is a relationship, and none of the Trinity are saying, me, me first, me first, I'm the best. They all defer to the other one and point to the other one. When, you, when we look at uh, Jesus' life, we see the Father saying, oh, look at my beloved Son. And we see the Son saying, oh, but look, I only do what the Father says. I obey him. And, and even Jesus, when he was getting ready to go back to heaven, and the disciples were like, don't leave us. What did Jesus say? He's like, no, no, no you got to let me go because something better is coming, referring to the Holy Spirit coming. And so the Trinity is this beautiful relationship where they're all deferring and preferring the other person. And so we must begin with this revelation that God is personal. Christianity is a relationship. God walked with man in the garden. He sent his son to restore relationship. And it says even now he's building a place for us. For eternity, so that when we go and are with Him in eternity, uh, we that relationship will carry on and be even deeper. And so, for many, the issue with Christianity is that it's too personal. It requires too much, and I don't think many people would think of it that way. It's like, no, well, my issues with Christianity is more intellectual or all these other things. But really. For many people, it's too personal. It requires too much of them. And if you think about us as a society, we really value our independence. We value setting our own boundaries and like setting up how we are gonna live my life and this is you know, my way. We value that as a people. But we know that anyone in a relationship begins to lose control of their life. That is the way of relationships. And even that statement right there might rub you the wrong way. <laughs> like, lose control of my life just because I'm in a relationship? No, what? Yes, that is the way of relationships. When you get married, you realize that you're making a decision that all my decisions moving forward from this point on are not up to me alone to make. Uh, there is someone else I have to check in with. <laughs> someone I have to get on the same page with. I can't make whatever financial decisions I want, future goals, dreams, desires, all of those things you now are bringing someone else into. And this is why a lot of people, you know, are kind of afraid to make that commitment because you know, like, oh, my personal autonomy, I'm losing some of that. We start to lose uh, control of our lives of being able to set our own boundaries. And so we can get frustrated in relationships because there is um, a lifestyle of deferring to someone else, preferring someone else. Our human nature kind of has a song that it likes to sing, and that is, would be a song of selfishness. Uh, you know, our, in our human nature, it's me first, my career, my dreams, my desires, my insert whatever. So human nature is very much saying me first, but the way of relationship says I prefer someone else. I defer to someone else. I praise someone else. I support someone else. It's very interesting to me that as our desire as, for, as a society, the desire for independence dominates. It is like the goal of every person even though we have this strong desire to, 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 to be independent and not beholden to anyone, we are absolutely desperate for a deeper identity. Desperate. Our society is aching for it. We are aching and desperate to feel unique, to feel special. And so we're to this point now where we're demanding that our individual identities be celebrated and highlighted and respected. I'm going to say something here, and I do not mean for this to be a political statement or an offensive statement. This is just an observation, okay? And how you personally feel about it is okay. But let me just make an observation. That we are now at a place in society that we are demanding for specific pronouns to be used for individual people so that we can feel validated, so that we can feel important, so that we can be seen we are so desperate for uniqueness, desperate to have an identity that gives us value, that makes sure everyone knows who I am and that I will never be misunderstood and that you know exactly what makes me important and special. We are here now at this point in society. These are real conversations we're having as a country, considering these ideas. There is a desperation in us as, as a people. There is an aching for identity. 
We want fulfillment. We want to be acknowledged. Some of the biggest fears we have is to be misunderstood as an individual, as a person. Anxiety is crippling our country. The generations that come after me, after my generation, they are absolutely riddled with anxiety. Riddled with it. And there are many things that you could point to to say, okay, it's because social media is the internet, it's all these things, and there's many things that contribute to that. But one huge one is that there are less and less institutions to trust, people to trust. Every time you open the internet, open the news, there's another institution. You can't trust teachers, can't trust government, can't trust churches, can't trust parents, parents abuse. And so to live in this world where it feels like there is nothing to hold on to except my individual sense of self of who I am so the pressure is mounting to prove yourself to prove your worth this conversation is very bleak <laughs> but I have very good news and that good news is that as Christians we get our identity from God from a triune God who we don't have to scrape and scratch and try to prove that we have worthiness. We don't have to try to prove that um, we are unique, that we am special. I gotta come up with something that makes me special from this person next to me. We don't have to do that. We know that it's not our proclivities and pleasures and peculiarities that are the sum total of who we are as people. We know as Christians that we are valuable because we are adopted into God's family. And he offers us the, the, the privilege of being a son or a daughter. He's also given us this un, unique and distinct qualities. I don't have time to go into this, but I'm just going to throw this in there. I took it out of my notes and I'm putting it back in right now. Because I just want to say this, but I don't have time to go into it, but it's just like, wow, fascinating. I think Tim Keller talks about this, and I think he's elaborating on C.S. Lewis. Uh, but uh, just pointing out the uniqueness that God is a triune God. God is a community, okay? So, um, so he is a community. But within that community, we also have three distinct persons come out of it, three distinct, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we, in turn, when we accept that identity, when we're brought into uh, this Christian life, we are brought into community we're in the family of God, we're in the family of this community, but we also get distinction. He also says there's something unique about you and you and a special purpose I have for you. So we are brought both into community and to distinction because that is who our God is. He is communal and distinct. This amazing news that you have God who is a father to you offering Adoption into his family means that you are not caught up in the race that society is caught up in, who are trying to prove their worthiness, prove distinction, prove their value, prove uniqueness. We are not in that competition. And when you accept what Jesus has done on the cross for you, when you accept uh, his sacrifice and you make that decision like, I believe you and I'm gonna be a Christ follower, you kind of get, essentially, you get a step off the hamster wheel and then you start to see like boy everyone is just running on this wheel trying to gain significance trying to gain importance through career through status through money through sex through individuality and when you get to realize like boy I'm not in that competition and you step out and you kind of start to see things differently like wow kind of like if you think about the matrix such an old movie now but you know you unplug from the matrix, then you see like, oh my word, everything people are living for is a lie. It's gonna fade into nothingness. And so if you are a believer, you have a good father. Here's just an interesting little thing before we bring up the scripture. God has eternally been a father. I, I don't know why that's kind of crazy for me to think about, because, but our only point of reference is that we at some point become a parent. We're not born parents. So there's a distinct moment before you're a parent and then you become a parent. And for us, it's a very um, 
wonderful experience, but your whole life changes. Like in a moment, you are changed because you become a parent. And then you have to think about and you have to realize all the areas that need to change and, your whole, and you're growing and you're changing. And even if you get to the point where you're like, I've got a million, even if you're like the Taylors and you're like, I got a million kids, we're pros at this parenting thing. Uh, even so, they, ch- they get older, they enter new seasons and, you, and us as parents, we have to adjust. Well, I'm, I'm good at the five and under thing, but now I have a teenager. Or I got the teen thing down, now my kids are getting married and your role is constantly shifting. But God the Father has eternally always been a father. He has never not been a father. And he will forever, eternally continue to be our father. I love that. Okay. Let's let's get to some scripture, shall we? Um, We're going to study a few verses from 1 John. There were so many. At first I was like, I got to show how the Father through the whole Bible. But I'm like... Y'all, if you're a part of the church, you know me. I, I just like to settle in in a couple of verses. So basically, if you open your Bible, you will see God as a father throughout Old and New Scripture. But we're going to settle in here today and look at a couple of verses. So we're actually going to start at the end of chapter 2 and just go in to a couple of verses of chapter 3. And now, little children. Why are we children? Because he's our father. Abide in him. I'm going to read it again. And now, little children, abide. Abide means to remain, stay, reside inside of him, God the Father, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Confidence means boldness. I can plainly stand there and be confident because, you know, he's coming back. He's coming back for us. And all who believe in him, we will live for eternity with him in relationship at another deeper deeper level than we have now because we will be like him. This makes me think of us being able to stand in confidence and not shrink back. Makes me think if you have children or if you were once a child and you tell your kids like, okay, it's time to clean your room. And in 10 minutes, I'm coming to check those rooms. And you either get a reward or maybe a consequence, however you roll, I don't know. But, you know, let's say there's, you know, still five minutes left and the kids that come out and they're like, you know, they're like shifting, they're waiting and you're thinking, okay, you've got five minutes left, you're ready? And they're like, I'm ready. I'm ready, just go look now. I don't even need the time. I don't even need more time. Those children are confident. Why? Because their room's clean. They're ready. They're ready for the parent to come and inspect the room. they're, They're confident. And as you walk down the hall to inspect the rooms, the other kids are screaming. They're like, not yet! Not yet! Because they're not ready. That's the image this gives me, that if we abide in the Father, we stay in that relationship with the Father, we have confidence for when he returns for us. Let's keep going. Verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Now we're into chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. This scripture right here, what a rhema for us. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we can be called his children. And we are, we already are. You already are. His daughter, his son, if you've accepted that work. That is what your identity is in. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So listen, don't get frustrated when people don't understand you as a Christian, when society thinks less of you or whatever. It does not know that relational no is not in relationship with God. They are not going to understand. Um, They're not going to know us because they do not know God. Let's keep going. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. I'm going to end with going down to verse 19. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. 
that word reassure, we are in the truth and we reassure our hearts. We persuade, we persuade to the point of believing that we can reassure our hearts that we are in him. And when our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart. He knows everything. You know the, um, the Greek word there for, gre- for greater? It means greater, but it also means louder. Yeah. Louder. And so when our hearts condemn us, those condemning thoughts, the condemning words, when you think, I'm not good enough, or I messed up here, or I'll never be here, or the thoughts, the voices, I love that imagery, that God's voice is louder. And so if you get discouraged because you experience condemnation, that makes you think like, oh no, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I haven't really accepted Christ because I have times where I doubt or I have times where I struggle. I have times where I wrestle and I, and I you know, feel guilty for things of, of areas I'm not perfect or where I mess up. Listen, scripture tells us your heart will condemn you. You will experience times maybe where you feel condemnation and doubt, but the promise we have is that God's is louder. God, the Father's voice is louder. He is greater. And he already knows. He already knows everything. Think about this. God is outside of time. He sees your life from the start and the finish. He has seen the entirety of your life and he still extends sonship to you. He extends the offer to be in his family. Him seeing the whole picture of your life. It gives me, uh, it makes me think of an image. I was trying, you guys, I was trying to think of a more beautiful imagery than this, um, like through fiction or a story, but the only thing that kept coming to mind was sports references. And that's fine. It's just sports aren't like super inspiring to me personally, but we're still going to use it because I think it's the best example. But let's use the example of like MMA fighting because that's what comes on in our house about once a month is the big MMA fights. If you think about it, those, those wrestlers are in the ring and the stadium is full of thousands of people. And those people are either cheering or booing the two opponents on the mat. And they have a camera inside the ring and these two fighters are like fighting for their livelihood. You know, they're all in. And even though there are just absolute madness sounds, like booze, cheers, screams, it's deafening. Even so, on film, when you're watching the fight, you can still hear the coach's voice. The coach's voice yelling to the, their teammate, telling them what to do. You know, move your arm here, tuck your head in, whatever the directions are. And that's like the visual it gives me. There are going to be times where your heart your, your thoughts may be condemning you, screaming, but guess what? God's voice is louder. And we are to listen to our Father's voice above any other noise. So my encouragement to you this morning is to abide in the Father. Remain. Stay in relationship with Him. Even if you are going through the darkest, hardest time of your life, Don't put your eyes on anything else. Don't shift and put your hope in anything else. Don't get back into the hamster wheel and start running, you know, thinking that, okay, once I get to this level at work, or once I get married, or once I have kids, or once I'm acknowledged, then don't do it. Abide in the Father. Stay in the Father. He is the only thing that will not fade away. He is the only foundation that will not crumble. We talk about this a lot in church, and so I didn't even really put it throughout it, but I just need to mention. We know that if you had a a poor example on earth of what a father is, that that can affect your view of God the Father. And so we know this, and many of us have had not great examples of what a father is. And so I don't know what your father was like. I don't know if he left, if he was cruel, if he was distant, if he was cold. But know that God the Father is offering sonship to you. He is your father. You know, there's a place uh, in the Gospels where Jesus says, don't even call anyone on earth your father. Don't even use that term, you know, because we, we screw it up so much. But God is your 
father. And, and when your heart, when your thoughts, when your history, your past, the family you come from, starts screaming in your ears, you're not going to do this. You're no good enough. You'll never be this. You're, you remain in the father. Our identity has to stay there. This, the Christianity is a relationship. And if we take our eyes off of the Father, if we do not abide in him, then it's shaking ground. It's not a firm foundation. Let's stand. And I'm going to pray for us, but I'm actually going to pray scripture over us this morning. Pastor Crystal talked about this a couple months ago, that you know sometimes you just don't know what to pray, but pray the word. Pray scripture. And so we're going to pray Romans 8, 14 through 17 over us this morning. If you know, like, I know that just my view of who God is supposed to be, I know that it's shaky. I know I don't have a good foundation to even know what he's supposed to be like. Or maybe you're like, what's my excuse? I had a, a, a good dad by earthly standards, but I continue to put my identity, I continue to put my trust, I continue to put my eyes on other things. God, help us that our identity would be rooted in our adoption. Our adoption by a heavenly father who has always been a father, who will always be a father. That will never change. So let's pray, Lord Jesus. We pray Romans 8 right now. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. For you, for we have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Father, we receive your word today. We receive and we choose to believe, we choose to place our identity in the fact that we are sons and daughters of you. We have been adopted into your family. We choose to get off the hamster wheel of striving, of trying to prove our significance, prove our worth, prove our worthiness. We don't have to. We accept that our worth comes from you, that you created us, that you see value in us. Father, change our thinking. Help us renew our minds, like scripture says, to renew it to your truth, to your word that we would not be bogged down with condemnation or doubt, but we renew our minds and we stand steadfast and secure knowing you are our Father. In Jesus' name, amen.